We continue with the second part of Sergey's talk. So, Sergey, I give you more. All right. So, um, in the second part, uh, we'll talk about. Um, so, that if, if I were to summarize the second part in one slide, it would probably look like this. So, it involves a connection between geometry of uh, moduli spaces. So, in this case, uh, I'll call this manifolds X. So, their geometric data is going to be of, of great importance to us. So, that's on one side. And something uh, on the algebra or representation theory side on the other end. So, this could be, um, if you wish, one minute summary of, of everything that's going to happen in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. Um, the algebraic structure on the other side uh, will be of a somewhat diverse nature. And uh, if I were to try to find uh, maybe uh, one, one all encompassing term, uh, the closest might be some kind of notion or generalization of modular tensor category. I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that um, as, as we progress. Uh, but let me start with geometry. So again, to be clear, this geometry has nothing to do with moduli spaces of flat connections whose quantizations was responsible for cutting and gluing formulae in the first part of the talk. This will be uh, yet another kind of geometry, but um, there will be, of course, connection to the first part and um, that, that will come clear later. The geometry that will be relevant uh, is hyperkeller. Uh, so will have three complex structures, I, G, and K, or any linear combination thereof. And there will be corresponding uh, Keller forms, omega I, omega J, omega K. That's uh, the standard definition of hyperkeller structure or hyperkeller manifolds. And as already mentioned earlier, uh, one very superficial similarity to uh, interesting aspects of the first part will have to do with the fact that it's really crucial for me for this story in the second part to be interesting that X is non-compact. So in the first part, non-compactness of moduli spaces of flat connections led to quantization that gave um, infinite dimensional space of states. That's, that's why instead of finite sums and cutting and gluing, we saw infinite sums or in the dragging dual variable, uh, the integrals. But uh, here, there will be something slightly different, but uh, in one way analogous, that non-compactness of X uh, will make the story much, much richer. And um, one aspect in which uh, it will make it much, much richer is, for example, that if I demand that uh, X is compact, then in hyperkeller dimension one, there will be only two examples, namely the four torus and K3 surface. And that's it. But if I relax this condition that X is compact, then I immediately have a lot more examples. So simple one you can think of uh, off the top of your head probably is uh, T star CP1. That's a nice hyperkeller manifold that's non-compact. Uh, similarly, resolutions of either Kleinian singularities also can be given uh, non-compact metrics. And in fact, there is a whole rich story here. They organize uh, themselves uh, in various classes uh, called uh, LE, asymptotically locally Euclidean, LAF, asymptotically locally flat, and then continuing with alphabet, people gave it uh, names ALG, ALG star. So there is a whole zoo of interesting, extremely interesting hyperkeller metrics on uh, manifolds of quaternionic dimension one. Uh, which would not exist if uh, we required compactness. So again, uh, that's not uh, the main reason, but that's one of the reasons why in the second part, non-compactness is going to be uh, our friend in the sense that it will make story much, much richer and interesting. And in this dictionary that, uh, or, or uh, this road that, that we're going to travel between uh, geometry of such manifolds and algebra, I want you to, think of, of this road as being some kind of actionable machinery. It shouldn't be just abstract formalism that uh, exists but hard to implement. 
it should be something extremely concrete. Whatever I'm going to tell you, uh, you can ask me, Sergey, how is it going to look for, say, T star CPN, for T star of the Grossmannian, for Hilbert scheme of endpoints on C2, all of which are hyperkeller manifolds and are non compact and satisfy these conditions I want. So basically, for any hyperkeller manifold, uh, you can you can ask me what is this going what is this algebraic structure going to be can i ask a quick question absolutely so you don't consider the cotangent bundle of the flag variety as well i mean examples you have are like cotangent bundle of partial flag varieties that's right three. yeah Yes, I, I mentioned a couple of extreme cases. Yes, it's a good example. I didn't put it here just uh, because of limitations of space. Perfect example, exactly. But uh, of course, it's an example, but is it uh, interesting for what you are considering? Um, I, I didn't consider it personally, uh, but um, I don't see any reason why it should not be non-interesting. I should not be, well, I'm, I'm confused with negations now. Anyway, it should be interesting. <laughs> So, so you, by the way, have uh, other groups, not just uh, GLM. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here, here, I just try to throw away most of these examples that come to mind from different walks of life. So, as you can see, I have Hilbert scheme of points. I could have replaced C two by some other LE space. Um, I gave Hitchin moduli space as yet another example. So uh, this is more ALG type uh, kind of. Uh, thing in, in general in high dimension, of course, um, but it's non compact and it's hyperkeller. That's good, that works. Uh, Catangent bundles work. Uh, this is basically uh, going back to work of Calabi and so on and so forth. So basically, I want you to think of your favorite, whatever it is, non compact hyperkeller manifold. And then we have the right to ask what is the algebraic structure associated to that? manifold very concretely so and and i have no excuse to to not give you the answer or or say oh it's going to be a very complicated computation uh, i want this to be extremely actionable so that it's 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 actually easy to use uh, dictionary so that's that's going to be geometry side of, of of this correspondence if you wish so what about the algebra side what do we really want to associate to to such spaces uh, and by the way, the, the, the spaces uh, are often called Coulomb branches. And um, part of what I'm describing is closely related to recent work of uh, Finkelberg, Braggerman, and Nakajima on, on Coulomb branches. So there will be a particular intersection or, or way in which we're, we touch on that subject. Um, so on the algebra side, uh, again, that notion which is probably the closest to what we want is that of a modular tensor category and that's a very loaded notion so it means uh, many different i mean uh, tensor category uh, which of course has a tensor product that's uh, monoidal braided and has uh, a quite, quite a bit of properties some of which we actually will need to relax so therefore if you don't know the full list that's totally okay uh, because uh, we'll relax some of the properties. In particular, in the end, we even relax the condition that it has finitely many simple objects. So that's uh, usually uh, part of the definition. But uh, if you're not very familiar with modular tensor categories, then uh, there are several ways to think about it. And um, one way which uh, encodes, again, one of the crucial pieces of data that, that comes in a modular tensor category is braiding. So this appears, uh, of course, if you think about braiding of strands as, as illustrated in this figure, and uh, recently plays very important role in condensed matter physics, <clears throat> where the strands can be thought of as trajectories of anions. So in other words, uh, this data of modular tensor category is basically anion physics in condensed matter physics. One of the uh, most famous um, modular tensor categories uh, is uh, Fibonacci MTC. It has uh, only two simple objects. And here I list uh, yet another piece of data which accompanies traditional definition of modular tensor category, namely S matrix and T matrix. Like I say, modular tensor category has uh, 
quite a lot of information and restructure that accompanies the definition. And to us, uh, in this hour, most relevant will actually be not the braiding that I mentioned a moment ago, but rather SNT matrices. So that's the part of the data that's responsible for the modular adjective in the name modular tensor category. So this SNT matrices form a representation of SL2Z. And um, that's, uh, that's, again, part of the data or consequence of, of the definition. And in the case of uh, Fibonacci MTC, where we have two anions or two simple objects, SNT matrices have very simple form and uh, are two by two matrices. The fact that there are two by two has to do with uh, two simple objects in, in the category. And again, if you don't know any categorical aspects, don't worry, because on the one hand, we'll, we won't need many of them. We'll only need the data of SNT matrices. So anytime I say MTC, you can think about SNT matrices very concretely. And uh, Another reason we don't need uh, the actual categorical notions is because the structures that we'll see require some generalizations. So if you know the traditional ones, uh, you'll have to relax some of the conditions uh, to encompass all of the examples that we can think of on a geometric side. So hopefully it's already clear from this couple of slides that uh, the two sides are very different. So very roughly, I want to take a very concrete non-compact hypercalar manifold such as, I don't know, Hilbert's scheme of points on C2 or Hitchin moduli space, and somehow to such manifold associate uh, SNT matrices. So that, that, that sounds pretty strange. Um, before I uh, reveal what's going on and how to work this dictionary, I also want to uh, advertise another question or problem uh, that uh, appears uh, on one side of this correspondence. Namely, I, when I read uh, some standard textbooks on, on tensor categories of when I was a graduate student, uh, I was always perplexed by uh, operation called Galois action. So it seemed very esoteric and algebraic and I didn't have a really good feel for it. So therefore, if I'm advertising to you that, that there should be some kind of dictionary between uh, this modular data of SNT matrices uh, and an algebra of MTC on the one side and geometry of some hypercalar manifolds on the other side. And natural question is, uh, what is the geometric analog of Galois action? Can it have a simpler explanation if we use this dictionary? And of course the answer turns out to be yes, otherwise I wouldn't be mentioning it here. In fact, uh, you can think of many analogs of this question. If uh, there is something that exists or some piece of structure that exists on one side, say geometric side or algebraic side, you have the right to ask what is going to be the counterpart of the structure on the dual side, I mean, uh, on the other one. Now, this uh, data of MTC, if you don't like tensor categories can be restated or related to various other uh, areas. For example, uh, it's related to topological quantum field theories in dimension three. I'll say a little bit more about this in a second. And it's also related to vertex separator algebras. In fact, the same SNT matrices that appear in um, uh, as part of the data of a tensor category basically tell us how characters of vertex algebras reshuffle into their linear combinations upon modular transforms. If you uh, try to perform modular transformation, they form uh, vector valued modular forms and the linear combinations under S transformation are governed by S matrix and under T transformation are governed by T matrix. So that's why these two key players, S and T, uh, also appear as important part of a study in VOA vertex operator algebras. So a simple example of a modular tensor category is uh, so-called Verlinde MTC. It's uh, associated to a group G at integer level K. That's exactly the same as what we saw uh, earlier in the context of WRT invariants. So it has corresponding vertex operator algebra, which is also usually labeled by G at level K. Uh, called WCW model. It has uh, SNT matrices such that uh, 
uh, they encode modular transformations of characters in this two-dimensional conformal field theory or vertex separator algebra. And I already mentioned earlier that uh, Verlinde came up uh, with a way to express partition function of a three-dimensional two QFT in terms of uh, matrix elements of the S matrix um, when, when manifold is uh, S1 cross the Riemann surface. So basically that takes the trace in the Hilbert space of our three-dimensional TQFT. So from the TQFT point of view, uh, which is the top corner of, of, of these relations, uh, it basically tells us about dimension of the Hilbert space, but uh, it's expressed in terms of matrix elements of the S matrix, uh, which uh, in Verlinda's work, uh, he thought of it as associated to vertex operator algebra data. So that's, that's uh, Verlinda formula and a nice link. And here, uh, what we see is how for particular class of three manifolds, namely the S1 cross Riemann surface, uh, the answer is encoded in terms of data of S and T matrices. So this turns out to be a very general statement. In fact, uh, for much more general three manifolds, you can write the answer in terms of S and T matrices. That's why they're important. And um, there is a theorem due to Turaev based on Rishiti and Turaev construction, which basically says that once you give me the data of this modular tensor category, in particular S and T matrices, uh, I can build for you a three-dimensional TQFT. So that's why uh, this, this link between um, MTCs and, and TQFTs uh, is a very nice uh, rigorous theorem, again, due to Turaev, uh, which is a generalization of a more familiar, perhaps, uh, theorem, which uh, I've heard as a folklore, uh, and then it's uh, rather simple. You can actually basically prove all the required properties quickly yourself. And that's usually included in standard courses on um, TQFT or algebra that says that once you give me a Frobenius algebra, I can define for you a two-dimensional TQFT. And indeed, basically uh, two-dimensional TQFT in the sense of IT should associate a vector space to manifold of k-dimension one which in this case is just a circle if we work with 2D TQFT. And this vector space is basically for Benius algebra itself. Then it should have additional structure that for say a pair of pens, uh, we get uh, a map from two copies of this vector space to one copy. And that's basically the product in for Benius algebra and so on and so forth. So this uh, theorem and three dimensions due to derive is essentially a generalization of this or analog at uh, one high categorical level where uh, you have slightly richer topology and the corresponding algebraic structure that's required to capture it is not an algebra, but rather tensor category. So, but again, the, don't worry about this uh, details. What's important or what's going to be important for us is the data of S and T matrices. That's gonna be the crucial ingredient in, in MTC that we'll need. And like I mentioned before, you can actually generalize this Verlinde formula uh, to write um, the invariance of not just as one cross Riemann surface, but more general manifolds in terms of these uh, values of matrix elements of S and T matrices. So that's why S and T matrices are very important and represent the crucial data. Now, what I told you so far is fairly traditional and appears in many textbooks, many courses. So that's, that's all nice. But uh, what we'll try to discuss today uh, in the second part is how all of this structure generalizes if uh, MTC is generalized from very traditional definition to non-semisimple, sometimes also called logarithmic because such kind of tensor categories are related in the same way as I described in the previous slide, to logarithmic vertex algebras. And logarithmic vertex algebras are called logarithmic because uh, correlation functions or modular transforms uh, or uh, a representation theory contains logarithms. In the representation theory, logarithm means that you start having Jordan blocks uh, and, and uh, not just uh, uh, diagonal values, which would be typical for semi-simple, uh, representations, but 
once you start having Jordan blocks, which are responsible for, for logarithms and correlation functions, that's where uh, logarithmicity comes in or non-simplicity. So these two terms, logarithmic and non-simple are sometimes used interchangeably. And um, corresponding to QFTs therefore could be called maybe logarithmic. So what I'll try to explain to you today is that uh, this logarithmicity or non-semisimplicity can be attributed at least to some extent to non-compactness of the geometry of X, which will be uh, the geometric side of our dictionary. So when X is compact, this dictionary or kind of dictionary uh, is actually reasonably well established. And um, this is another place where Coulomb branches naturally appear uh, namely through the work of Rosansky and Witten. So Rosansky and Witten basically said that they can associate a TQFT to every compact hyperkeller manifold X. And if X is non-compact, uh, they very carefully point out in their paper that things break down and they don't usually go in that direction and point out lots of questions. So our job will be to try to address those questions. But when X is compact, then uh, this invariance of three manifolds of Rosansky and Witten uh, have uh, definition not only in mathematical physics, but in rigorous mathematics through the work of Konsevich and um, Misha Kapranov, who used uh, slightly different techniques, either uh, at E-classes or, or other tools, to provide the definition of this rosansky witten theory. Um, from the viewpoint of TQFT, uh, maybe I'll go back to, to this uh, slide for, for a second. Uh, the tensor category I should have noted uh, is associated, is, is what you would naturally get for a circle. So remember in the IT axioms, you associate numbers to three manifolds, vector spaces to two manifolds in the context of 3D TQFT. And uh, you associate category to a circle in co-dimension two. So therefore, uh, it's natural to ask uh, what would be associated to a circle in the rosansky witten theory, which takes a geometry of hyperkeller manifold as an input. And if you ha it has to be a category, and therefore it has to be a category associated to geometry of X. So let's call the target of this, of this theory X. Well, there are very standard categories that we associate to manifolds. And one of them is derived category of coherent sheets. And indeed uh, people such as uh, uh, Justin Roberts and Simon Willerton ask this question, what would Razansky with on TQFT associate to a circle? What, what kind of category? And indeed, the answer is that it's some version of derived category of coherent sheets. So again, details are not important. It is basically derived category of coherent sheets. But those of you who like categorical aspects, I want to point out that uh, derived category of coherent sheets for um, uh, the way we typically think about it for, for manifolds such as Calabiao manifolds or Hyperkeller manifolds in my context, they don't really come naturally with a braiding, braiding data or modular data. Because see, in, in, in MTC, the crucial ingredients, as, as we mentioned earlier, even if we don't worry about the rest of the definition is braiding and modular data. So natural question is therefore, uh, how do we reconcile it with the fact that a garden variety derived category doesn't seem to have this property. It's neither braiding nor, nor modular data. Um, and in particular, uh, we're interested in the case where X is non-compact. So you might expect that things are in some sense even worse because uh, even at the level of Grothendieck group, uh, this, this derived category will have infinitely many simple objects. So that's, that's the problem that we're facing or uh, one way to express the problem that uh, it, it's uh, responsible for this dictionary between geometry of X, which might be called Coulomb branch, and uh, some kind of algebraic or representation theoretic data. Uh, but, but we're facing this, this problem that if X is non-compact, then we need to get somewhere the data of S and T matrices. Well, in the usual setting, I already mentioned, uh, by usual setting, I mean semi-simple setting when, when everything is standard. Uh, 
we have the familiar Verlinda formula, which at the level of TQFT basically says that either dimension or more generally graded dimension of the space uh, that we assign according to IT axioms to surface of genus G, um, equivalently the three manifold invariant on a circle cross that Riemann surface can be expressed as sum over matrix elements of the S matrix. So that's, that's the key formula that will be important in the rest of this talk and uh, will play a very important role. And again, in the semi-simple or standard setting, this is something very familiar, very well known. When your Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, a priori, um, this answer or such kind of formula would make no sense because trying to sum, uh, uh, to take the dimension we would give you infinity, but uh, in settings where uh, this Hilbert space uh, comes with additional grading, you can actually try to find um, a nice regularization or way to make this expression finite at the cost of dependence on additional variable T, uh, which keeps track of the grading. Of, of this dimension, graded dimensions. Again, assuming that, grade, that, that graded pieces are finite dimensional. So in that setting, you may hope to produce some kind of equivariant version of Verlinda formula. And um, this uh, idea was uh, heavily used in many different works. In fact, some of them were already mentioned earlier this week. Um, but one aspect I want to emphasize is that even though in this setting, the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, the sum over this label lambda, uh, namely the, the, the size of the S matrix in this uh, context is still going to be finite. So that's an important point that, that, that I want to make, that at least in applications uh, to this dictionary that I want to discuss today, uh, we will most of the time ask for uh, equivalent for Linda formula or, or this kind of expression to have finite set lambda. In other words, uh, this uh, S0 lambda will, will be matrix element uh, of matrix of finite size. So even, even though the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, effectively there will be some finiteness in the form of, of this T dependent S matrix, if you wish. So that's um, the key idea. So then implementation of this idea is uh, fairly straightforward and is based on a T bot or rather a T Siegel localization formula, uh, which you can apply to geometry of space X uh, with properties that we needed from the beginning, namely hyperkeller manifold, such that if it has a uh, holomorphic circle action, which I denote U1 T, T because its corresponding equivariant parameter will be T from the previous slide. Then you can actually write very concretely uh, the formulae for desired matrix elements of S and T matrix in terms of classical geometry of space X. So here I'm writing uh, this answer, assuming that each fixed point of the circle action is isolated, namely that uh, we deal with fixed points rather than components of higher dimension, but it's very straightforward and easy to generalize it to the situation where you have components of higher dimension. And that's interesting. I don't mean to say that uh, we need to avoid it, but, but for uh, purposes of the exposition, let me focus only on the examples which have isolated fixed points. In that case, the data of each fixed point uh, on uh, such space X uh, is basically, um, I mean, the, the way uh, circle action or C star action acts on it um, gives you uh, several pieces of data on the geometry side. Well, first of all, uh, it's easy to show that this action, I mean, essentially by definition, all the required assumptions in our setup, it's called Hamiltonian, and therefore there will be corresponding moment map at every fixed point. And uh, values of the moment maps at fixed points will give you uh, eigenvalues of the T matrix. So 
And um, then there will be weights, uh, which tell you how normal directions, normal bundle at a given fixed point is rescaled. And that will determine effectively the uh, matrix elements uh, as zero lambda that, that, that we also need. And uh, perhaps most importantly, I should have said that uh, the number of fixed points will tell us the size of S and T matrices. So, so the number of this T lambda lambda and number of S zero lambda will be precisely the number of fixed points. Uh, Sergey, uh, yes. just uh, so, so on the slide, you show a formula for S zero lambda. What about generic S uh, lambda one, lambda two? That's, that's, that's a very good question. So I don't have a simple formula for this. So we have two papers with Nakajima um, um, and, and uh, they, this talk or this part is based on the second one, which is uh, kind of for the development of earlier work uh, in which we ask exactly this question. So it can be indeed, so uh, it can be recovered from the geometry of X, but it requires uh, considerably more work. And um, that's one of the directions that I personally would like to see improved. So I, I uh, strongly advertised um, in the beginning that whatever this dictionary is, it should be actionable and easily computable and so on. And I'll try to do this to the best extent I can, but this is actually one question where technology exists to ex extract this matrix elements uh, as lambda mu, but it's not efficient. And, and I would love to see, and in fact, uh, my question would be more, uh, so, so the way we do it is it requires to deal not with numbers, but now start discussing more of the categorical aspects of the story. And a uh, conceptual question I want to ask, or if you allow me to rephrase your question is, is it really necessary to discuss higher categorical structures to understand this matrix elements other than a zero lambda? Or one can still find some uh, numerical formula that works, in other words, uh, bypass uh, high categorical structures. So I actually, I don't know the answer to this question. And um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Of course, uh, if uh, S and T matrices are of fairly small size, what one can do is to try to uh, simply uh, deduce the, the missing elements, for example, of S matrix. T matrix is always diagonal, but for S matrix, one can simply try to deduce it from requiring SL to Z relations, but uh, this is not gonna work for matrices of size greater than, I don't know, three, four or something. So it's, it, it's only works on low dimensions. Right. Um, so that's, that's the basic setup. So uh, again, I'm hiding under the hood some technology of uh, IT bot or IT Siegel localization. IT Siegel is uh, of course more appropriate because we're, we're dealing with index version of localization formula, but many of you are familiar with it. And uh, if I were to summarize what comes out, this, this is basically what comes out. So the upshot is that for every fixed point in our geometry of X, uh, we get, um, in the language of MTC, a simple object. And therefore the size of S and T matrices and um, uh, number of simple objects will be related to number of fixed points. Again, assuming they're isolated. Generalization to non-isolated is interesting, but I'm not going to discuss it. So in the very beginning, I gave you lots of examples uh, for what X can be. It could be Hilbert scheme, it could be cotangent bundle, it could be moduli space of fixed bundles. And all of the spaces can be arise in mathematical physics as Coulomb branches. That, that's that's uh, the term. Uh, and in fact, the definition used by Nakajima, Finkelberg and Braverman. And um, uh, one simple example could be, um, which actually is on, at the intersection of several classes that I mentioned in the beginning for, for what space X could be, is to choose X uh, to be moduli space of Higgs bundles with certain ramification. And uh, in this case, it's going to be a hyperkeller manifold of uh, quaternionic dimension one, 
So it's, it's actually a very simple elliptic vibration um, of real dimension four. And if you run this machinery, it has only two fixed points and they're isolated. So the data of these fixed points um, encoded in the moment map and the weights uh, is written here. And basically if you feed this, this data into a uh, formula on the previous slide, uh, that gives uh, T matrix in terms of moment map and uh, S matrix in terms of the weights. Uh, that, that's where uh, the um, K theory earlier class comes in. Then you, you basically get uh, the, these values and these are precisely the values of S and T matrix for Fibonacci MTC that uh, we saw in the very beginning. This is one of the simplest textbooks MTC that- um, Sergey, just, just, just perhaps a naive question. So those weights, they're not integral. Does it mean that this is some kind of or before or something, right? Because typically S1, I mean, naively U1 weights, you would think of them as integer. You're exactly right. That's, you're exactly right. It's in, in fact, uh, in this example, which I didn't even give it precise name, uh, this, this uh, fixed points are uh, indeed uh, orbifold points. And that's, that's exactly the, the origin of this non-integrality. So in some sense, it shows that it, it's kind of interesting because it's this non-integrality that then gets responsible for some of the uh, fief in this Fibonacci thing. So, yeah. so th this example, if I were to describe geometry would be, uh, would be slightly interesting and involved, much simpler example, which I'll show in the next slide, is, is basically T star CP1. It's of the same dimension, namely quaternionic dimension one, but that's really the simplest non-compact hyperkeller manifold in this dimension that you can think of. And here again, the uh, S matrix, uh, and as well, of course, as T matrix is, is of size two by two. And here I write it in terms of two variables X and T. Uh, so I don't know if there is an easy way for me to ask the audience, but I want to ask the audience uh, the following question, which is a simple quiz. So first of all, why do I write uh, only two uh, elements, namely why, 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 why is the S matrix of size two by two? That's question number one. And question number two is uh, why do I have uh, each one depending on two variables, X and T? So why two by two and why, uh, why two variables X and T? Uh, so anyone wants to answer Sergey's question? Well, I wouldn't want to get this uh, wrong. Because it's a toric variety. You have a uh, two-dimensional torus setting, no? That's yeah, the answer to the second points. question. Thank you. Yes. Two fixed oh, I see some people unmute themselves. So yeah, please go ahead. The two fixed points and um, and the two-dimensional torus section. Thank you. So that's that's right. <laughs> so I'm just trying to to see how awake uh, you guys are. For me, it's morning. For you, it's evening. So yes, that's absolutely right. So I, wait. So I didn't quite understand. I thought so. The T and X are the two. One rotates T star, and the other rotates the the, the CP one. No. Well, it, in some sense, it doesn't really even matter because. Uh, I mean, you can redefine no. them, but, but uh, Tamash is right that the key point is that there, there are two, uh, torus is two dimensional in this case. You can of course reorder and redefine things, but uh, whichever way you do it, uh, you, you'll have two circle actions. That's the important point. Well, I don't know. I mean, now it's, uh, you know, I mean, you have a concrete space. Concrete T and concrete X. So you can't really say it's uh, not important. I mean, it is important. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And on the next slide, I'll, I'll give you a concrete version. Ah, so, of but on this paper. slide, it's not important. <laughs> yes, on, the on other the... thing I didn't understand, well, um, I thought that the point is, uh, for the for your first question, I was thinking it has something to do with um, the property of the, the S matrix that it's somehow unitary or some some... No, no, no. I, again, I, you, you're thinking about higher level versions of these questions. I was just thinking numerology, like where uh, size two by two come from? Why, why two by two? And I why like two, two, two variables? Oh, and okay. uh, again, uh, not specific assignment of these variables that I'll discuss on the next slide, but just numerologically where each 
two comes from? And the answer indeed is for, to the first question that there are two fixed points. That's why we get two by uh, two. No, my, yeah. I, I understood your question is that actually we don't, why don't you write S10 and S11? I mean, uh, that's a little. Well, that's in, in, in that case. So that's related to question that Anton was asking, but in this case uh, it's, um, of small enough size that you can actually uh, try to complete it. But again, I'm not going to do this, so that's not going to play because a role. You see on your, on your slide, you actually have three twos. You have two variables, x and t. You have, uh, and then you have two, a two by two matrices and also you have two lines. You see, these are three different twos. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And I thought they were all different, different effects. Uh, you're absolutely right. They are, and the third version, the third question you're asking is is extra credit. That's that's a good. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> okay. But thank you guys. You 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 got it right. So uh, again, uh, it was a very low brow question. Uh, so two fixed points and two circle actions. So now I can actually say a little bit more about the circle action. So you're absolutely right, Anraj, that it's it is important or they can be different. And uh, in this case, I'll, I'll give you a slightly different ways of thinking about the circle actions. One is a holomorphic circle action, and the other is actually triholomorphic symmetry of, 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 of this T star CP1. So, uh, and this will play a role, and one, uh, and, and that's why now, from now on, the variables X and T will have completely different uh, role and meaning. So T I'll use just for holomorphic action, which is not necessarily triholomorphic, and X uh, will be equivariant parameter associated with the triholomorphic symmetry. So the, sorry, the holomorphic action is the scaling along the fiber. Yes, yes, exactly. In this, uh, right, so in this basis, that's basically uh, scaling along the fiber. So uh, then, then we can basically write uh, the characters, uh, ch churn characters of a tangent bundle at the fixed points. They have this form and um, they, that's why it's an easy exercise. Uh, you get uh, exactly these denominators uh, where the, this monomial, so their powers of X and T are related to, to the weights, which we see here. Here, they're of course integers. So unlike previous situation, which Anton correctly identified are more orbifoldy, here there is nothing orbifoldy going on. Each fixed point is locally just a copy of C2. It's a North Pole and South Pole of the two sphere, the CP1, and the, the, there is no orbifold, so everything is integer. So we just see pluses and minuses, plus one, minus one, basically. For, for these actions. So uh, we got two values as a zero uh, lambda for, for these two fixed points. So if we apply Verlinde formula, uh, we, we basically sum over as zero lambda squared. And uh, according to this technology, what we obtain is invariant associated to S1 cross S2. Right, because uh, Verlinde formula says that you take S0 lambda to the power two minus two G. When, when G is zero, you're basically summing S0 lambda over lambda squared. And uh, what you get is invariant of S1 cross S2. And in the context of rosansky witten theory, um, in general, this invariant of S1 cross S2, just like in many other contexts is basically integral over your target of a roof genus or also known as a Hilbert series. So what, what this answer should be is a Hilbert series of uh, target space X. And indeed, uh, if we assign uh, the weights uh, T and X to, to the two circle actions, to the two C stars and write Hilbert series of T star CP1, we're going to find exactly this expression, which we now got by summing over two fixed points. That, that's, an, that's not really rocket science, but it's a cute neat exercise that you can check. So that's, that's, that's one comment. Well, I, I guess, uh, yeah, this formula integrating on X is a little, uh... You mean just formally localizing, right? Equivariantly, equivariantly, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, otherwise yeah. it's a bit difficult. 
Yes, exactly. Everything, right. So everything in, in, in the second part is equivariant. So we are heavily rooted in localization. Um, but again, this, this last formula, once you start, uh, so localization would give you two pieces because there are two fixed points. But what I'm saying is that you can basically get it in one go if you think about T star CP1 as, as a complex surface, which of course it is. It says basically a quadric and uh, just try to uh, compute this Hilbert series. So that's one comment. Another comment is that, as I try to emphasize, the role of the variables X and T is very different. So geometrically, it's different because one is holomorphic and the other happens to be triholomorphic. So X is better uh, if, from the viewpoint of geometry. So three is better than one. So, so X is definitely an interesting guy. So what's so special about it is that X is something that you can actually define not just on S1 cross S2 or on S1 cross Riemann surface. If I were to sum over lambda as zero lambda to the power two minus two G, I would get S1 cross Riemann surface. But uh, X is something that actually makes sense and can be defined on a general three manifold. And in that case, X would take values in pantragging dual to spin C structures. And indeed notice that in the present case, we're dealing with S1 cross S2. So we know already from the first part that on S1 cross S2, there are infinitely many spin C structures labeled by Z and it's pantragging dual is C star. And that's, where, that's why we have only one variable X for this example. If I were to do it for um, more general three manifolds, I would find many different X's and um, that, that, that would be the role of this triholomorphic uh, uh, symmetry. So it would give rise to as many parameters as Betty numbers in our manifold. And if, if there is torsion, then also two discrete labels. So that's, that's another cool thing about this, this structure. So now uh, I want to say that this, this simple example, T star CP1, if you understand what's going on here, then, then basically you understand the whole second part of, 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 of our discussion. Because uh, from here on, you can generalize it in a couple of different ways. And I want to consider one particular generalization. Uh, namely, I want to point out that uh, T star CP1 is a hyperkeller quotient of H2, two copies of uh, quaternionic space by U1. So from this H2 triple slash U1 hyperkiller quotient, and it's easy to see that you should have uh, two uh, circle actions on the resulting quotient space. That's one way to, to see that you have two dimensional torus acting. And um, this hyperkiller quotient has a natural generalization where we can replace U1 uh, by UM with uh, any value of M. And uh, instead of dividing H2, two dimensional quaternionic plane uh, by U1, we can consider uh, two M copies of M dimensional fundamental representation of UM. So because we have two M copies of M dimensional representation, the total dimension in the numerator is going to be two M squared and uh, UM acts uh, as on two M copies of, of U1. So this space still has uh, U1 holomorphic symmetry U1T, it has triholomorphic symmetry U1X. And instead of um, just simple monomials in this Hilbert series, one in the num numerator and a couple in the denominator, what you get now is a product uh, of terms up to M. So uh, that's, that's something not so hard to work out. And, um, more of a challenge is to try to get it from this S0 lambda that you can get from, from fixed points. But let's take this class of examples and play with it a little bit. So this is another representation of-, of Sorry, this. is in this, can I ask a question? Is in yeah. this the cotangent bundle of the Grassmannian 2MM? 2MM, M comma M. Or yeah, M dimensional subspace is in 2M dimensional space. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. That's a good question. Okay. It, 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 it could be. 
it looks like it, but maybe I am mistaken. So it, it, even if not, it's it's a close cousin. It's it's yeah. a, it's a close cousin. But definitely. So I'm thinking of Grossmannian as as a quotient of um, u two m divided by u m times u m. So it, it is very similar here. But but there is uh, something. That, that needs to be shown, for example, whether the second quotient by UM in the usual Grossmannian can be related to uh, moment map or stability in, the, in this language of the hyperkiller quotient. So that's not obvious. There is a description of the cotangent bundle of any partial flag variety for in the AN case by these AN kind of cures. And I think exactly. this is the Grossmannian, but okay, I may be wrong. So. No, and, and it, it's, it's a good question. In fact, uh, what's even better is to consider the entire family uh, of, of, the, of the partial flag varieties. So they, they, they should be, uh, again, good candidates for other examples. And I think they'll give something interesting because th this family will give us something interesting in just a second. So therefore, generalization you're suggesting is, is, is also cool and uh, probably will give something similar. Nakajima described this somewhere, so it's not. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. So that's uh, there is a good chance this is just T star of of GM comma two M. Yeah. Um, right. In fact, even dimension matches. <laughs> so here I was thinking about dimension. So that's that's this family summarized as a bunch of uh, nice. Uh, spaces, of course, non-compact as we always wanted, uh, realized as hyperkiller quotients. Uh, T star CP1 sits at the very bottom. It's the simplest uh, member in this family. Uh, the spaces have quaternionic dimension M squared, and um, you can basically run the same machinery. So you'll get this Hilbert series as a function of X and T, which uh, from the viewpoint of TQFT gives you invariant of circle cross a two sphere. Now, the spaces actually have a name. So uh, the reason I chose this particular family is that uh, the spaces are called uh, transfer slices in affine Grassmannian. So that's that's why they're interesting to me. But, um, um, and, and affine Grassmannian arises in the opposite extreme limit of uh, taking M to be very, very large. So if M goes to infinity, the spaces will be approximating a fine Grassmannian better and better, or more precisely one component in the fine Grassmannian for SL2. And again, I, I mentioned earlier that everything I'm doing in these two hours is for SL2. So T star CP1 is the simplest member, is one extreme. And when M goes to infinity, uh, you should expect another extreme where we're getting close to a fine Grossmannian. And in the Hilbert series that's written here, notice it's infinite, it's, it's finite product. It's actually very easy to, to take M to infinity. What you get is uh, essentially finite Pachheimers get replaced by uh, infinite Pachheimers in the denominator. So that's, that's easy. In fact, um, um, Another operation I want to consider is to taking cotangent bundle to a fine Grossmannian. So at the level of Hilbert series and uh, many such localization formulae, taking cotangent bundle usually means doubling the formula. Uh, in particular, if you had numerator, you get denominator or vice versa. So uh, I won't go through this uh, in more details and just heuristically will say that if you consider cotangent bundle, to this affine Grossmannian, instead of a uh, denominator, which contains three infinite Pachheimers, you also get numerator, which look very similar. And it also allows you to introduce yet another variable Q, which often appears if you take a uh, cotangent bundle. So once you take cotangent bundle, you get now three variables, Q, T, and X. So X is uh, coming from trihalomorphic symmetry, that's the same we had all along. Uh, T comes from just holomorphic symmetry and that's kind of variable that would not be allowed to be turned on on a general three manifold, but can be used on a Swan cross Riemann surface. And there is also a variable Q, which in the context of a fine Grossmannian can be interpreted as a loop rotation. And here is the definition of a fine Grossmannian or rather a cotangent bundle of it. You can think of it basically as moduli space of Higgs bundles on a Riemann surface, which is just a, a disk, 
with no boundary conditions imposed. So that's why it's infinite dimensional. So in some sense, it's a very degenerate member of this uh, family of examples of moduli spaces of Higgs bundles, where we go all the way to extreme by uh, making Riemann surface uh, as, as degenerate as possible in just a disk. But now something nice happens. This, this answer that we get as a Hilbert series of this cotangent bundle to a fine Grassmannian obtained as a limit of these finite dimensional models is nothing but the Q series that we saw earlier. It's, it's precisely this uh, type of Q series invariance of a Swan process tool. And in fact, variable X here appeared exactly for the same reason. It keeps track of spin C structures. And remember in the beginning, I promised to you that uh, WRT invariant for S1 crosses two, which is equal to one for every root of unity is not going to have something completely trivial when continued inside the unit disk. Namely, first of all, it won't have a single Q series. It will have infinitely many labeled by spin C structures. And moreover, Q series are not gonna be just equal to one. And, and that's what they're equal to. So from this formula, you can extract the answer. So therefore, uh, now we went full circle. So I gave you some examples of how to associate algebraic structure or MTC or TQFT-like structure to Coulomb branches. And if you go to a very extreme example where not only X is non-compact, but also infinite dimensional, such as cotangent bundle to a fine Grassmannian, you actually recover the story from the first hour. So you, here I check it using the S matrix or rather its values as zero lambda, but we can also get T matrix into the game by considering invariance of uh, length spaces and try to work with integrating not a roof genus, but rather a roof genus wedge churn character of a line bundle over, over target space. So that's something I didn't discuss, but it's easy modification. And in fact, if we try to do it in the context of a fine Grassmannian, the formulae that, uh, we can compare it to the first part of the talk have already appeared from the viewpoint of localization in this nice work of uh, official Grinovsky and Telemann where they uh, studied localization on loop Grassmannians and uh, for closely related reasons basically got an answer which would be a special case of this formula where k is equal to one namely we're dealing with a three sphere. So in fact, this is uh, this invariant written here is this Q series for, for three sphere, Z hat invariant of a three sphere. So to summarize, uh, in the first talk, I focused mostly on uh, aspects related to quantum groups at generic Q. Our matrix is associated to it and quantization of SL2C flat connections that can be arranged in the structure that behaves nicely under cutting and gluing. And in the second part, we talked about localization on hyperkeller manifolds, uh, different from moduli spaces of flat connections, but the two stories can be nicely connected when this moduli space uh, X is T star of a fine Grassmannian. And um, um, I showed you some, some computations that can allow generalization of each story in various different directions. So now I want to thank you for your time. And of course, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot. So for questions or comments, yeah, I already see Thomas has a question. So I now unmute you. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, my question was, uh, so in this affine Grassmannian, there are these Schubert cycles, which are relevant in, um, in Hecke operators and Hecke transformations. And in fact, you have this Kajdanlustig theory, which talks about some local um, singularities inside these Schubert cells. And I believe that these, these slices you were talking about could be a hyperkiller resolution of those, but I'm not 100% sure. My question is, do you see the relevance of these Schubert cycles uh, inside the Grassmannian um, somehow in this story? Could they be, are they interesting? Um, I'm sure the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, I have to say that to me, um, the, 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 this is uh, fairly 
new subject in a sense. Um, I worked on Schubert cycles long, long time ago in the context of uh, categorification and quantum groups, but um, I never, but, but this were Schubert cycles and the usual finite Grassmannians. So uh, I didn't really have until this project any experience working, really working experience with affine Grassmannians. So I don't know the answer to a question of the top of my head, but um, it sounds like a very, very relevant question. And um, I think it's, it's good to I think one should check out this. I, I will check it out because uh, in Kapustin-Witten, they study these, uh, they call it the spaces of Hecke transformation, uh, of, uh, which is labeled by, um, by weights of the Legland's dual, uh, dominant weights of the Legland's dual group. And, mm -hmm. and for each of them, you can, you can close it down and you have singular points corresponding to dominant weights, which are smaller than the original one. And, and for each of them, you have a singularity. And in some cases, they study resolution. They, they find this hyperkähler locally at that singularity, and they resolve it. I think in this example, they get precisely T star P1. But I am therefore guessing that this, what you call the affine slice, Mm -hmm. uh, I my my guess is that it could be one of those resolution of those uh, singularities, and uh, yes. But uh, for what we study there, the intersection cohomology of the singularity matters, and that is given by Bajdanustic polynomial. But you have this uh, not small but semi-small resolution, so I think it's uh, there's slightly more stuff in it than just intersection. Yeah, I, I think that's extremely interesting. Uh, and again, I'm hesitating to, to give a general answer uh, without uh, checking. I just don't want to say yeah, something me, I'm me not too. confident me, me about. Too, so. But, but uh, I'm pretty sure that, again, the answer is yes. And uh, in, in it, it might be several things which are somewhat important. One is that in um, here I focused on SL2 and um, everything. Um, is nice and has a resolution, but in, in if you consider other Cartan types, that was some other question you were asking. What about generalization, say, to other G, uh, especially if it's not of Cartan type A, then we can quickly get to something which is non minuscule and then badly singular in that case. Of course, this won't uh, have nice resolution. It um, sounds, by the way, very good that you make a difference for minuscule and non minuscule things because it's exactly how it is in the story. The, the Schubert cell is uh, always smooth exactly when it's minuscule. And then if it's non-minuscule, you have singularities. And what you're saying sounds reasonable. That only SL2, for example, I know that the, this space is always rational. It's, a, it's only has or before singularities. And maybe that's related. Anyway, I'm just saying that it sounds, uh, the music of what you are saying um, sounds relevant. Yeah, I totally agree. And that would be one comment. Uh, another comment is that uh, it, it depends on what we want, but um, um, here, here there is another thing that, that happens. So in general, uh, slices in a fine Grassmannian are not hyperkeller. So here it happened uh, for a reason that I can explain in more detail for, for SL2. In fact, uh, a fine Grassmannian has two connected components. And in one of them, uh, which is what we, we saw uh, here in, in the last uh, part, um, slices are hyperkeller, but this is like an accident. In general, you should think of them as um, perhaps singular, but killer spaces. And of course, a way to make hyperkeller space out of killer is to take a tangent bundle. So therefore, what I really am interested in, and that's what's relevant to, to this Z hat Q series, is not quite a fine Grassmannian itself, but a tangent bundle. And for that, we need to choose the right model. And therefore, there is another version of the question that you're asking, namely, uh, what about do, do Schubert cells or whatever their analogs uh, exist or play a role in cotangent bundle to a fine Grossmannian rather than the Grossmannian itself? So there is a slight deviation from maybe from, from usual Schubert cells in the fine Grossmannian. But again, I, I don't know much about it. So I think it's a fantastic uh, problem to, to study. It has many connections to this uh, BF and technology, which is also new to me. And like I said, I'm, I'm learning a lot of it on the fly. So.
Yeah, actually for me too, I started okay. to look at this. Uh, thanks a lot. So are there other questions perhaps? Uh, but sorry, I, I think I maybe caught Thomas's question, so you, you will continue asking the question. Yeah, I just mentioned too that I started to look at this three weeks ago, so it's not, <laughs> I'm also very new to these, uh, these things. Well, um, if you want, yeah, we can had, um, try, try, try to pursue it together. Two series that you showed in the end, right? If you go back maybe a couple of slides, right? There was that Q series, uh, maybe more, right? That Q series, for, right, that one. Uh, so so like how is it in the end, if Q goes to, the, to those uh, roots of unity, so uh, does it go to one or does it go to something else? Like kind of how does it connect to the... Uh, to, to, to what you showed in the first part of the right so uh, yeah that's that's a good question so first of all uh, again here are this three variables which I even try to color differently play quite different roles so x is the guy that encodes dependence on spin c structures in both parts of the talk so we shouldn't really think of this as a function of x even though often it is tempting what we should think instead is expanding it in x formally and just asking about Q series that multiplies every given power of X. So that's the first exercise. Uh, another thing we should do quickly is to remove the variable T if we work with a general three manifold. But uh, if you work with a Swan cross Riemann surface, we can keep T that's uh, sometimes called refinement and um, often is related to McDonald polynomials and other things. But um, to really connect to the first part of the talk, what you would want to do is uh, to actually uh, remove variable t, and then, namely, set it to one. I think in this, in my notations, uh, it's it's t equals one that, that that will give unrefined thing. And then you see that some this whole mass will actually. I mean, you have like three Kupperheimers in numerator, three in denominator, but they're infinite Pachheimers, so they're they're pretty bulky. But uh, things will dramatically simplify if t is equal to one, because what will happen is that uh, infinitely many terms in numerator, denominator will cancel. And what we'll get in the end is just a rational function. It still is going to be interesting rational function. It will, be, it will depend on x and uh, q. So it will have denominators, which means that if we try to learn expand expanded, we'll have infinitely many power of x. Uh, but each power of x will be multiplied by something relatively simple in terms of q. So that's how indeed we do get uh, for s1 cross s2, uh, infinitely many spin c structures are activated, but in each spin c structure, we have something fairly simple such as monomial in terms of q. And when q goes to root of unity, it becomes a one or something like that. So that's, that's roughly how it works, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, any any other questions? I have a, just, um, just a short I'm question. Sure. If you go back in the slides, in a similar, you have this equal. You had several of these equalities with the maybe maybe a bit more without the infinity because that's I already don't understand the one before. Yeah, it's like this one or this one and any of these. Yes, so. so but there was one, one also, so that when you inserted also a, an invariant, right? A, 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 like a three manifold invariant, right? So there's, a, so there's three things you had least some, some of like a matrix or like S matrix um, element squared. Then you had a three manifold invariant, then you had an integral, and then you had a, had a, a you know, a, a rational function, right? Like mm -hmm. the previous, like the next one, I think, or a previous one somewhere. No, yeah, like this, 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 this was, no, no, this one. Yeah, you see, you have like this sum and then you, so now I just wanted to understand which part is, is sort of non-trivial here. I mean, uh, which, uh, which um, like, of, like uh, say the integral equals to this series, that's trivial, right? So that's just an, 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 a notation. Then the, I don't quite know what the S zero lambda for, for which exact theory I mean, I didn't quite understand what what theory this applies to. And then is is this equal? So yeah. So then then this equals to the next one. That's a tautology, sort of, or that's non-trivial. 
Right, so that's that's a good question. Let's try to disentangle it. So yeah. uh, in some sense, the integral of a roof genus over X is most related to a zero lambda because we define, so, so what we say is that, maybe I should have stressed it more, that we don't know how to define a zero lambda by other means. That's that's where there is there is this puzzle, like uh, how do you associate S and T metrics to derive category, especially if it's non-compact space and so on. So we just say, let's define as a zero lambda using this formula. So for us, uh, I should have put colon equal uh, because this is definition of a zero lambda. This is really the definition. So this it's, is trivial. Then then this is also trivial somehow. And then what about the middle one? Hold on, hold on. So oh, the, the, for the, the first uh, sum over lambda, zero lambda square equals this a roof genus, that's basically localization formula. Okay. So, so that's that's not totally tautology, but it's it's localization. It's almost tautology. So then what becomes interesting or somewhat non-trivial is that uh, the Hilbert series of X is equal to the sum. So that's something to check, right? But which because sum? He, why? Uh, sum over a zero lambda. Well, because there is no sum here. Uh, when you compute Hilbert series, you basically ask slightly different question. You're not trying to integrate anything by localization. What you're trying to do is to ask uh, how many holomorphic functions do I have on my space? Yeah, but isn't that the definition of the Hilbert series? Well, the, I mean, you're right. trying, I mean, okay, there's some vanishing theorem, but modulo that, this is also, this is basically what the okay. Good, 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 yes. I'm just trying to say that this is slightly, at least to me, this is more interesting statement than relation between this, um, the, the left and right thing, which is basically okay. the definition and localization. Then what about the middle one now? Right, so the middle is uh, something that um, taps into uh, three manifold topology. It's basically saying that what we can compute on X uh, if if we, if our focus was so much on uh, X so far, it basically says that it has a value for invariance of three manifolds and tells us for which particular three manifold. In fact, we can easily start generalizing it by saying that if I replace this power by two minus two G, mm -hmm. it will be as one cross sigma G and so on and so forth. So basically it shifts our mindset from the hyperkeller space X to invariance of three manifolds and forces us to think about this as um, trace over Hilbert space of some TQFT on, on a two sphere. And as you can see, this TQFT is gonna be very funny because uh, if, if it's semi-simple or WRT type TQFT, then S1 cross S2 is uh, equal to one. I mean, the Hilbert space is one dimensional, but here we're getting a huge series. I mean, it's it's already telling us that uh -huh. something interesting is going but, on. But so, but excuse me, but so, so, but there is, so I was just trying to understand that. So is, but there's an independent definition of this object that equals to this, that you talked about or, or this. So, because I just want to understand, yeah. Because you, I understand you described a little bit things, but I just wanted to under, or, or so these or all these equalities are roughly definitions or no? So this, I just can't. Uh, I just wanted to because I really like these equalities. So I just uh, right. Uh, so, so it's 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 um, in some sense uh, trying to develop something. So so okay. the, okay. the the Swarovski witten theory is is not well understood when X is non compact. Uh -huh. So uh, it's basically trying to ask a question, how could we make sense and what kind of definitions we can give and then the rules of the game mm -hmm. so that um, all the good properties are working in the sense that we can still have cutting and gluing. That's what topologists would probably want. But we also want to keep as many of this formulae that we know and love, such as Verlinda type formulae and mm -hmm. then this integrals. So, and, and somehow this has not been studied. So at this point, this is, um, I mean, this middle formula is an attempt to, to make sense of, of, of that theory. So it, it's also a definition, but of a slightly different nature because defining a zero lambda using equivalent localization is something straightforward and conceptually easy to many of us, I hope. But, but assigning this to S1 cross S2 is something that requires a lot more thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and this is something which, 
I say I wouldn't object if somebody wants to propose a different way of making Rosansky Witten theory with non-compact target space work. So mm -hmm. this is our attempt. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you for the, the great talk. It was very intriguing. Yeah, thank you for well, all, all thanks a lot. Probably now we should slowly wrap it up. Uh, thanks a lot for a great talk.